and also for Asa's 60th birthday. So I'm going to tell you a very simple story uh, about the Hubbard model on bioliability. And um, this really is sort of a, you should think of this as an addendum to some previous work that was carried out by uh, Oscar Wafeng and uh, his collaborators. Do I need it? Oh, you're recording. Write down the 
Hamiltonian, the time binding Hamiltonian, the following way, f is this usual term that comes in graphene that vanishes with the k at the different points. And the Hamiltonian looks like that. This, so this is the usual graphene term for each layer. So the, the ordering here basically is a on the up, b on the up, a on the down, b on the down. And then you can see this term here, that is the hopping between the two different layers. Okay, it couples a on the up to b on the down and, and the, the permission conjugate of that. Now, this thing is independent of momentum, so you can actually, these are the high energy bands in some sense. You can actually project them out and go to the low energy subspace. And when you do that, you find something that looks like this. So you get this f squared and f star squared, and this is the origin of this quadratic band construction. Okay, so at the k and the k prime points, you have these two bands. One of them is full, one of them is empty, and they touch quadratically at that point. And all this is true precisely for Tw equal to zero. If you make Tw slightly different from zero, then what happens is that this quadratic band touching splits up into four different <coughs> Dirac holes. Okay, you have to, so this quadratic band touching has a winding number, as you can see from here, f squared and f star squared. So you have to conserve that winding number as you alter the Hamiltonian a little bit. So basically what happens is that out of these four, you will have two canceling and two adding. And so uh, you'll, you'll recover this winding number of two. All right, this was all pointed out actually quite a pretty long time ago by McCann and Falco around 2006. All right, now, so let's turn on some interactions. So here's this uh, seminal work of Waffeck. And there was a, there's a whole series of papers which are listed here, Waffeck and Yang, and, and Waffeck himself, and with, with a few other collaborators. And basically, the idea is to uh, look at the power counting of these interactions. So it's a two plus one dimensional theory, but the kinetic term is quadratic. So it's actually a z equals two theory. So therefore, these four Fermi interactions are actually marginal in this theory with the quadratic band touching. Okay? So that's very nice. So what Moffat did was he took all the interactions consistent with the symmetries of the lattice and he classified them. And it turns out that there are nine different classes of these couplings. Okay? So there are nine different coupling constants, g sub i. And then he derived the one loop RG equations, which were first pointed out by this young man sitting over here. And so uh, these are the equations. These are what the equations look like. So every particular GI depends on all the others. And there's some you know, structure factor, whatever you want to call it, CIJK, GJDK. All right. Now, this is actually a very complicated sort of RG flow equations because there are nine of them. But uh, generically, here's what happens. Waffeck has analyzed them all in detail in his long papers. And so here's roughly what happens. So any microscopic interaction you put on the lattice will actually not just populate one of these GIs, but several of them together at once. So the initial conditions are certain values of all these GIs. And then you let them flow using your RG. And typically what happens is that if you don't fine tune it, typically some set of GIs actually flow to strong coupling. Okay, so, so it almost always flows to very strong coupling. And so there's going to be, it appears as though there's a weak coupling instability exactly as there was with the BCS, okay, in the usual Fermi liquid theory. Okay? So almost any GIs you put on there are going to flow to strong coupling. And so it seems that even at weak coupling, there's going to be a symmetry growth the state. So that is the conclusion of this RG done by Oscar. Okay. So in this particular case, if you just take the strong coupling fixed point that starts from the Hubbard interaction, the Hubbard interaction, it turns out, populates only three of them initially. And you let them flow. And it turns out that, that what appears to be the case is that the strong coupling fixed point is a nail state. It's just a standard antiferromagnet, like up on the A and down on the B. OK. Now, there was an earlier work in which one of the <coughs> people who was co-authoring it was exactly this Thomas Lang, who is a numerical expert. And they concluded that basically this, this really does happen. And they did it for small lattices. And they found results that indicated that there was a nail state regardless of how small the initial covered interaction was. And that's exactly what Wolfex argued.
So now, we started numerics. When I say we, I'm speaking very loosely because I didn't do any of the numerics. So it was actually uh, Thomas Lang and, and Sundar and Pujari who actually did the numerics. So uh, here's what they did. They did some quantum Monte Carlo. And we start with a model in which there is no trigonal warp. This Tw is equal to zero. And uh, what we look for is a single particle gap as well as the spin-spin structure factor, MPK. Okay. So now what you want to do is you want to find some kind of signal that symmetry is actually spontaneously broken on this lattice. So one way to do it is to look at just S of k at k near zero. And as you can see here, what's happening is that if you take mu equals 2 on some particular size of a lattice, then you'll find that basically the structure factor looks smooth. If you take u equals 3, then there's a giant spike that's arising at q equals 0, and that's a signal that the system is actually condensing into some kind of a symmetry broken state. So you can eyeball this, but it's actually pretty difficult just by eyeball because there's a lot of finite size effects and things like that that you need to take into account. So there is a slightly more sophisticated method and uh, that's called some kind of binder correlator ratio. And so what you want to do is something like this. So let's imagine the simple case that we have where it's really the, the symmetry breaking or the putative symmetry breaking is going to be happening at q equals 0. Then you take some particular value of q <coughs> which is of order 1 over L, where L is the linear side of your lattice. And you ask yourself what is the ratio of this structure factor at this very tiny value of q to the structure factor at q equals 0. So if the state is truly symmetry broken, then as L goes to infinity, this thing should vanish because there should be symmetry breaking only at q equals 0, not at any q which is not equal to 0. Okay, so that ratio should vanish and therefore this, this Binder correlator ratio should go to 1. On the other hand, suppose symmetry is not broken in this lattice and it turns out into a symmetric state in the infinite size limit, then what should happen is that this structure factor should be analytic near q equals 0, and therefore this value, g over l, which is a q of order 1 over l, should be roughly the same as s of 0, and therefore this number should approach 1, this r should approach 0. Okay, so r goes to 0 indicates that we have a symmetric state in a thermodynamic limit, and r goes to 1 indicates that we have a symmetry broken state. All right, so here's the picture of what's going on there, um, you can see that there are these various crossings. Okay, so as you increase the size of the lattice, initially the crossing point, so this is L equals 6, 9, 12, so this is 6, this set of orange squares, 9 is this set of yellow circles. You can see that the crossing point is over here, then between 9 and 12, it actually moves to somewhere over here, and then you might worry that as you increase the size of the lattice, this crossing point is going towards 0. But actually it's not. And you can see that the very last few of them seem to actually be crossing at the same point, which is somewhere near mu equals 2.5. So, so according to the theory, yeah. the characterization of the exponential is small in u equals small u, right? That's correct. So that's but there shouldn't be any crossing. As you okay. take this Binder ratio, right. you could imagine that if that was really exponentially small, then all these things would be going to zero, but then they would, they would not actually cross. I think that's what I would expect. But I'll show you a little more. Okay. Okay. Other question? Is this is the terminal for Monte Carlo? Uh, I actually don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's the kind of Monte Carlo that we put us, whenever it is. I think this is a model that doesn't have a side problem. I just have to remember that. So apparently it's, it's, it's easy to do this. I'm sorry? Yeah, as I said, I, I didn't do the numerics. But it's a sign problem free model, so apparently you can do very good science and so on. <coughs> okay, so now, so, so let's accept this fact that there's actually a finite coupling phase transition, and the phase transition actually happens somewhere around 2.5. So how do we understand this? So let's go back to Vapex RG. And in Vapex RG, they were all basically marginal. And so as soon as you put in even a tiny coupling, some particular combination of couplings is going to flow off at least in one loop. And therefore, you should have a weak coupling instability. 
and instability for an arbitrary small value of the couple. So then the question arises, so this is what was the last, how is it that you understand the fact that it takes a finite amount of coupling in order to get a phase transition to a symmetry broken state? So here's the explanation we came up with. So the point is that at the bare level, this trigonal warping, remember what the trigonal warping does. It takes the quadratic band touching and converts it into four Dirac cones. If you had purely Dirac cones, then of course the four Fermi interaction at power counting would be irrelevant. Okay? It's marginal only if the kinetic term is quadratic. So as soon as you introduce any trigonal warping, then this infinitesimal coupling instability will go away and it will become a finite coupling instability. Okay? So if you look at the diagrams, the self energy diagrams, which is now beyond the one loop that, that Rafa considered. Okay, so this is beyond what Rafa considered. So if you consider the self energy diagrams, there are two kinds, right? There's this guy and the exchange guy. And uh, of course, as a, as a function of n, the number of flavors that you have, these are going to have different dependencies on n. So therefore, it suffices to just look at one of them. And if you look at this one, you can actually compute it, at least. You can, you can show that it's not zero. And so what you find is that this kind of TW is actually generated in two loops. Okay, so even though you didn't have anything to begin with, you have something generated. And so what should really happen is that here's the, the RG flow equation for weak values of both the coupling constants that Waffe classified and also this trigonal warping term. So if you start with it being zero, it's actually generated to quadratic order by this, with some constants over here, and this is the full set of RG equations. So what happens here, of course, is that if you start at TW equals zero, it gets generated. Once it's generated, it's actually relevant at the quadratic band touching fixed point. It has a dimension of one, so it increases exponentially. Okay? And that is really what we believe is happening. So that's the reason why this infinitesimal coupling instability is turning into finite coupling. So uh, here's, here's what, I, what I just said. Um, so if this is all correct, then basically that finite coupling transition that we found should be the same universality class as the gross level, which is the, the thing with the Dirac cone. The number and, of uh, cones is different. I'm sorry? The number of Dirac cones is different. So the, the number of Dirac cones is different. That is correct. Um, so here's. What we did, we tried to do a data collapse. Again, I'm using the word we very loosely here. So, uh, uh, Sumiran and, and, and Thomas did the data collapse. And here's what it looks like. If you take this particular function here, you, you want to find out what is the value of mu by doing this. And also, you, if it's really a gross error model, it should uh, have the uh, critical exponent z being equal to 1, okay, not equal to 2 because it's a linear dispersion. And so here's that, and you plot it against that, and there's a data collapse. Okay? And from this, you can infer the value of mu, which is roughly 0.9 or so. So here's our grand hypothesized phase diagram of what's going on here. Okay? So here's the quadratic band touching point. That direction, so TW can actually have two different signs. Okay? And depending on the signs, the splitting of the four Dirac cones happens differently. Okay? So there's actually a Lipschitz transition at, at exactly this point, TW equals zero. So basically, any value of TW that is not equal to zero has four Dirac cones around every k and k prime point. And uh, so here's, here's what we believe is the flow diagram. So if you start somewhere here, which is what our simulations did, right? You start at TW equals zero, and you increase the value of u then basically you start somewhere on this x-axis and you're going to flow. So initially, of course, just like Waffet assumes, you're going to start flowing with, with the g's increasing, but the g's will start generating some tw now for you, and it's going to flow off the x-axis. And once it flows off the x-axis, it increases exponentially, and that means that your Hubbard interaction becomes irrelevant, and then it flows back to zero, and this is roughly what happens. At some strong enough value of u, of course, you flow off to some other fixed point, which is in the gross symbol class. And beyond that, you find this male antiprogram. Okay? And so there's some 
very narrow region over here, you could fine tune yourself to lie in this sort of, I don't, I don't even know what to call it, some, some, you know, this is actually a very simplified picture because there are really nine different coupling constants. So I'm able to show you only two. And uh, so you can sort of use your imagination. So it's a very narrow region here where the, the generated value of this TW is exactly canceled okay, so there. And there, this Wafek RD would actually presumably be correct. And there would be a weak coupling instability if you confine yourself to this extremely narrow point of light region. OK, so here it is. I'm almost done. So we studied the Hubbard model. And uh, this is actually a second look. I think my initial title was a second look. There was, there was something about second look at it. That's because Wafek had already taken the first look. And uh, so, so uh, TW equals zero, non-zero non TW is generated. It modifies Wafex RG. So again, we're not saying Wafex is wrong. Wafex did it up to one loop. This thing is generated only up to two loops, but it generates something qualitatively different from what is happening at one point. So there's a phase transition at 2.5 roughly. Critical is point new, new equals 0.9, and this consistent with some previous work by Rajiv Chandrasekhar and, and, and collaborators. Um, and so we're, we're currently studying what happens with full interactions. Okay, so uh, let me end that. And uh, let me say to Asa, so I had uh, actually, using my broken Hebrew, I managed to figure out how to say happy birthday to Asa. So where's Asa? Yom Ulidet Sabiyah.